All right, we are live. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone regardless of religious or non-religious background and allow for open dialogue. Attendance day at the Helping Parents Hill meeting is voluntary and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose children have passed on. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentation whatever may benefit you personally. And thanks for attending tonight. Hey, everybody. I'm going to introduce our guest tonight, who was Sandra Champlain. Uh, Sandra is probably one of the first people to do a, a podcast on the afterlife. And uh, just my a personal note, I, I met Sandra, I guess, about almost five years ago uh, through her podcast after my daughter passed away. It was one of the first things I listened to. It's called We Don't Die Radio. Uh, you can find Sandra at wedontdie.com. She's also the author of the best-selling book, We Don't Die, a Skeptic's, um, a Skeptic's Discovery of the Afterlife. I can't remember the subtitle, but uh, I'll let Sandra tell you guys that. But uh, Sandra has become a, a dear friend of mine over the years. She's a friend of Helping Parents Heal. Uh, she helps uh, guide people to us to for healing. So with that, I want to introduce to you Sandra Champlain. Thanks, Brian and Ty and Irene and Elizabeth. And hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's interesting because, you know, I get the introduction and I never in a million years thought I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. So you just never know where your path is going to take you. So I'd like to talk a few things today, this evening or this morning, depending on where in the world you are. Talk a little bit about me and my journey. Talk about some of the reasons I believe in the afterlife. I have a little slideshow that I've brought with me and then talk a little bit about what I think it's all about, you know, the big picture. And first of all, how ever you are right now is just perfect. And I know we, our emotions are real high these days with uh, many of us still in lockdown, depending on where we are. Add to that, I, from the bottom of my heart for whatever um, you have experienced grief wise, you know, we never want to call it a loss, but it's, it, it feels like a loss because your person is no longer with you, although they still live on, that pain is still there. So grief is a, a just a, well, probably the, one of the worst things that we human beings will ever feel. So I just send you a lot of compassion and love wherever you are. And I will talk a little bit about grief too tonight because many of us, um, like for me, you know, I have a day job cooking for race car teams. However, I'm unemployed right now and I don't, my future is uncertain. There's a lot of people without work. There's a lot of people still housebound and we have no idea how it's going to play out. And I have learned myself that anytime there's this unknown, we can ignite the grieving process. And we've all, it's one common thing that we all have experienced is grief and have you noticed that sometimes it's a Hallmark card commercial or just the littlest memory and it can ignite everything and have it flooding right back. And I know about the fear of the future, the uncertainty, um, and I personally haven't had anyone impacted by COVID-19, but some of my friends have. And just other people's grief can really ignite our own grief. So wherever you are on the roadmap of emotions, you're in a perfect place, just be you, and we'll be here together. First person, not really the person I wanna introduce you to, it's, it's a, a thing, something we all have, I call it the voice. Inside each one of us, we have this voice that is constantly talking, nonstop. Things are good, things are bad, how's it gonna go? Thinking about the past, worried about the future, giving us a ton of guilt, you know, whatever that may be, we all have it. That is also the voice of our skepticism. It can be the voice of our ego, 
Uh, somebody said ego stands for edging God out. I thought that was pretty good description. But it runs on autopilot. And I'm just asking you to consider for the hour, hour and a half, however long we're here, as if that voice comes up that says, oh, that can't possibly be true. That can't be real. You know, that's the same voice that can look you in the mirror and tell you some negative things about yourself that aren't true. You know, we're often harder on ourselves than we would ever be on someone else. So I think having that voice as a byproduct of being human, it kind of keeps us thinking that this life is all there is. And I am thrilled to learn through my almost 25 years of investigation into the afterlife and all the people I've talked to and now 340 episodes of We Don't Die Radio, that when we take that last breath here on earth and close our eyes and open them again, we are surrounded by our loved ones, our pets if we've had them, um, our, you wanna call them angels and guides, all those wonderful people, we're whole again, we have no memory of any pain, it's all good. And that little negative voice, gone. <laughs> so, but for this time, that, that voice might kick in. So I'm just going to ask you, you can come back a little later, but just put them in the, on the side. So a little bit about me. Uh, my book is titled, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. I didn't believe in any of this stuff. My parents, great. We went to Catholic school, Catholic church every Sunday. Never really gave faith too much thought. I went through the behaviors, you know, as we do all the actions every Sunday, but never really bought into too much. Uh, dad, an airline pilot, mom was travel agent. We had a local psychic in town who predicted that the maid of the mist at Niagara Falls was going to, um, the, the boat was going to capsize with a bunch of deaf children on it. And that never happened. And so in our minds and growing up, we were just told, you know, don't believe in that kind of thing. You know, you have to see it and hear it and smell it and taste it and touch it to believe that it's real. So that's just kind of how I grew up. And in the mid 90s, while being very busy in my career, I got a huge fear of dying. No one had passed at that point earlier, you know, I'd lost pets and my grandfather had died, but nothing like really happened then. But I was so afraid of even going to bed at night, not knowing what would happen if I didn't wake up. And I went on the secret journey of, is there any evidence of the afterlife? Is there anything that can rest my fears? Didn't tell anybody about it. I personally used to call people crazy that believed in this kind of thing. And I certainly didn't want anybody to think I was one of these crazy people. And I went in through a journey of first studying all the major world religions, um, and realizing that although most everybody has a faith of the afterlife, it didn't quench that thirst. It didn't uh, cure that fear that I had. Eventually, I started dabbling in the world of the metaphysical. And although we have limited time together, I just want to tell you this um, through helping parents heal, and I'll verbalize it, how everyone can get a free copy of my book and a free copy of everything because we're not gonna squeeze it all into this time window that we have. But I ended up taking a course in mediumship. It was somebody who had said, if you come to this course, I can prove to you that you're a medium, that really all people are, that we're all these souls having a human experience. And my, one side of my brain thought there is absolutely no way that can be true. But the fear side of me that, was afraid to go to bed at night, said, I, I have to research this. And so I'm just going to give you the condensed version of the story, but I show up on this weekend retreat, small amount of people, didn't know anybody. And it was the first time that I heard that um, mediums, you know, that we all have this inner soul power, that we can connect to another human being heart to heart, that we can uh, envision that we have this love around us that connects us, that people, our loved ones or children who are in the hereafter, it really is just here, just after, that we are all 
energy and energy as we know can never be destroyed and so mediums can just raise and try to raise the vibration a little and our loved ones try to lower their vibration a little and then we meet in the middle and how we can use our power of imagination to connect and this all sounded good still wasn't convinced and she the the instructor just gave us an exercise she says we're not really going to do any mediumship now but i just want everybody to get a feel for when we do it so by telling us we weren't doing it then of course I could play with my imagination and she had everyone pair in twos and I picked a nice looking lady and she says to hold hands, close your eyes. And she says, I want you to imagine that you're around in a, just all this love is around you. She says, I want you to invent someone in your mind's eye. It can be a man or a woman. And she says, I just want you to tell the story. So she says, you have to be polite because we're still people. We're not balls of energy. We are still people when we transition and introduce yourself and then just tell a story, maybe who the person was, what they did for a living, if you get a feeling how they died or if there's any personal message that wants to come through. Because this woman said, I am to make it up that I wasn't, we weren't really doing mediumship. I had the perfect go ahead for just creating. So with my eyes closed, I held this woman's hand and I just imagined, you know, we're connecting heart to heart with all this love. And I started painting a picture of this guy I invented. I said to her, uh, there's a man standing behind you. Uh, I feel like it's your grandfather and his name is Jan. And he was a fisherman in Denmark. He had blonde hair and blue eyes and really windburned skin, big gap between his front teeth. And in my imagination, he's puffing away at a, on a cigarette. So I said, oh, he died of lung cancer. And then I just got this feeling that uh, the message was that he never told your mother that he loved her. He was just a tough dad. Never said, I, I love you. So could you give your mom the message? So I opened my eyes, ready to tell this lady, okay, it's your turn. And there's just streams of tears going down her cheeks. Her grandfather's name was Jan. He was a fisherman in Denmark, fit the description, died of lung cancer, and was that tough father who never told his own daughter that he loved her. I'm getting goosebumps every time I tell that story because it was one of those holy cow moments that if mediumship was real, certainly it wouldn't be a gift given to me. <laughs> and for the very first time, it started opening me up to this possibility that there was something more. Now, unfortunately, the next time I tried to do it, now being a medium, I had so much pressure that I was trying to do it right, that it blocked the flow, I was making it up. And so I realized that, you know, we always hear these two sides of our brain, we have a creative side and an analytical side. Well, I think it's the creative side that lets all of this flow through. It's our imagination. And once we start to really dissect it, that can turn it all off. You know, so how many of you have felt your loved one with you? You might be driving in the car and you feel them sitting in the seat next to you. You may be waking up in the morning and you feel their presence or you smell a familiar smell or you hear the sound of their voice or right before you go to bed. Those are the times when that analytical mind, that voice is more at rest. And so while we want to think that was just our imagination, I want you to know that how they come through is through our imagination. So don't let that voice sneak in that says, oh, it can't possibly be. Guess what? It can be. So on my journey, I, man, I learned a whole bunch of things. I learned about near-death experiences and all these people that just before, um, you know, when they flatline, they can see a light and they can see loved ones. And, you know, that skeptical Sandra that used to be, used to think, oh, that must be they're just their brain shutting down. Well, did you know that they have uh, even the doctor, uh, it's not a doctor, but Ken Ring is his name. He would research people who have had these near-death experiences that were always blind. And when they had their near-death experience, they could see. 
They could very accurately see things that were going on. And like that science behind that is just so magnificent. Uh, obviously there's mediums, okay? There's all kinds of different mediums. I've seen mediums that can do an evidential reading on someone. I have seen mediums that are artists and they're not only telling you about the person, they're drawing a picture of them. I have seen mediums and it's, if you ever saw the movie Ghost, there was a scene where Patrick Swayze stepped into Whoopi Goldberg's existence and she started speaking the words of uh, um, Patrick Swayze to Demi Moore, forgot their characters' names. But I, and it, this is rare to see, but I've actually seen a medium do this. It, and it's something they're in like a trance, like, well, I guess it is en entranced, I would say. No one ever takes over anybody else's energy or steps into them, but it's just a, a blending. And um, the communication back and forth to the two people, there, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. This wasn't for money. This wasn't anybody trying to get rich and famous off of it. This is just pure communication. I've seen that. It's absolutely amazing. I've studied things like near, um, not near death, uh, deathbed visitations just before people pass. Very often they see their loved ones. There's a really great story of a woman who was researching these uh, um, pre-death visitations. And it was a young boy in hospice. And he, just before he passed, he looked in the corner of his room and he was laughing and he was talking and he was happy. And this woman said, well, who are you talking to? And oh, Bobby, Steve, and Jim. And moments later he, he passed. Well, Bobby, Steve, and Jim were the last three boys that lived in that room before they transitioned. So there's those kind of things. There's um, things like electronic voice uh, phenomena using a tape recorder and recording sounds of rain or a fan and then playing it back and having voices on there. Uh, all sounded very creepy. And on my journey, I went, you know, I would embrace the fear of doing some of these things. And I, I went for it anyways. That's what they call courage, being afraid and going forward anyways. And come to find out, Messages that would come through are only love, humor, not any of that crazy stuff that you see on TV or in the movies that's scary. There's something called induced after death communication. There's a doctor who used to work for the Veterans Association and for people who had post-traumatic stress disorder, there's a way to dislodge memories of what happened with the emotion and it has to do with left, right, left, right eye movements. And I don't know how that part works, um, but he gave somebody a little too much of the left, right, left, right eye movements. And it, it kind of transported this man into a, an altered state where he actually told the doctor about his own deceased loved ones. And the doctor got involved and did a little bit more research on this. And long story short, short uh, now it's called induced after death communication and it's a therapy to those deeply grieving where you can work with some of these trained therapists in the world and they are all trained therapists it's not just an everyday joe who <laughs> has a shingle out no they're very trained therapists and help people reconnect with their loved ones so in the course now of all these years i've I found out about all these stories and if i could give you everything that i've learned Boy, it, I tell you, it would take you from going from a hope that the afterlife is real and a faith to an absolute certain knowing. And before we're done, I'm going to show you some pictures that may take you a little bit further there, okay? Um, but I never told anybody about any of this afterlife stuff I was doing. Didn't tell a word. I thought I should someday, but who am I, right? I'm just Sandra and I'm busy working. And I never wanted to be classified as one of those little crazy woo-woo people that believed in this metaphysical stuff. So I kept my mouth shut and, and I was very busy uh, until my dad was diagnosed with cancer and five months later, he passed. It was, it's easy for me to tell the story now because right now I'm not connecting totally with the emotions, but the emotions, I can tell you, as you well know, they're absolutely brutal. Um, I was with my dad the last five months of his life. He, I fell in love with this man like I never loved him before as adults. Um, unfortunately, during the time 
my siblings and I started fighting about dad's care. And I, I learned after the fact how people can do that. There's something called anticipatory grief. Um, when dad took his last breath, it was really awful. He had an incredible amount of pain going through his body and um, he wasn't conscious, but you know, the body was still screaming out in pain. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, at that time, my siblings didn't even want me in the room because I got labeled somehow as a greedy sister that I got close to my dad because I wanted more of his money when he passed. And my siblings are great people, so I don't know why that, that even happened. Um, dad ended up passing and um, things just got worse between the, the relationship I had with my siblings. Uh, not only did they cast me out, but because I was close to my mom, they kicked her out. I went through what I would have to say, and I know many of you have felt this, the deepest, darkest despair and time of your life that you wonder if life is even worth living. I wasn't going to check myself out of life, but I, at that moment, had compassion for people that do take that step, knowing how brutal it can be to be in our own brain. And somewhere in that deep, dark place, it was like the light bulb went off that I am so far not, I mean, I'm not Sandra. I am not the person that I normally am. I mean, it takes a lot for me to get mad or sad or angry, really angry. It takes a lot. And like that side of me was always there. And I'm sure you felt it too. And it feels like this dark cloud is over your shoulders that you can't breathe, that you're suffocating, that your memory can be gone. Uh, you can either sleep too much or not enough. The, the guilt trips that we put ourselves on over and over and over, what we should have done differently, um, just all kinds of things. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here that we know about these things. And so I don't know why, but something told me to study grief, what it is and why we have to go through it. And I kept digging until I could find something that really helped me. And while I do believe for some people, you know, there's medications and things like that, I'm not a doctor, so I don't get involved with that side. I do believe if you are somebody in need of help, you know, your doctor's a first person to turn to, and there is so much help available. But I found, and it took some digging, that when we go through the grieving process, we actually go through a physiological change. And our body, our whole being is trying to adjust to a new reality Unfortunately, the more we love, the more it hurts. Because you may hear somebody way out that you didn't even know. And if they pass, that eh, doesn't bother you. But the more you love, the more it hurts. And I can talk about love and grief. And this is a kind of a poor comparison. But if you imagine someone who is um, addicted to some kind of chemical, some kind of drugs they're on, okay? And you can imagine what it's like when somebody removes that drug from them. They, they go through a period of withdrawal and they aren't themselves. They're in a lot of pain and it takes a long time before they get back to normal again. Well, grief is somewhat like that. Love is something that connects us more than just this feeling. It's like we have these neurotransmitters that go through our body and our mind and almost like a car has the windshield wiper fluid, the gasoline, the oil, the brake fluid, all these things, transmission fluid, that keep it running. We have these things called neurotransmitters. When we grieve and we are getting used to a new reality, we almost deplete these neurotransmitters and it takes a while to bring them back up. So I was finding out through all my research that this is why we have all these side effects. This is why we have the anger and the rage and those feelings of guilt and uh, the sickness and 
uh, uh, loss of memory and um, you know, the, just all these thoughts that go through our mind so fast. It all has to do with this. And it started giving me this feeling like, oh, let me have a little compassion here for myself. And I also learned, and some of you will find this very interesting, that these neurotransmitters have, um, are in charge of our perception too. So the occurring world, like if two people look at the same accident, you know how they say people can see different things? Well, it's even worse for the grieving mind because we're storing information not properly, but yet we think we are. So our perceptions off, and why I think this is valuable for myself and maybe even for you and your family, is I found my siblings and I were fighting about things that didn't even happen. I logged them one way, they logged them another way. And unfortunately, we all think we're right. So it, it, it really took something. And even now, 10 years later, I still have a brother who's 100% out of communication. I have uh, two sisters and one of them got back into communication and things are better and just about three years ago. And the closest sibling that I've ever had was also the hardest one and really believed that I was this uh, monster. I finally got to see her for the very first time this, the end of January, which is huge because I've had tears about this for 10 years. And so we're starting to build that. And just this past Mother's Day, just a um, week and a half ago, my mom actually got to have a, a Zoom call like this with both with her other two daughters. So to me, that's a miracle, you know, and so it happens. Things take time. But as we progress in the story, I felt like I needed to tell this story about grief and there are things to help you feel better. You know, it's not an overnight thing. Absolutely not. But getting some sunshine, getting some exercise, practicing meditation, being with friends, being... Uh, taking some time to watch something funny or a movie or something to get your mind off the grief actually helps raise these levels of neurotransmitters. And there's other things as well, getting involved in you know, being of service, things like that. Eventually, I decided I'm going to take everything I know and I created an audio called How to Survive Grief and I posted it on Facebook. That's it. And within a month, over 3,000 people had shared it. And this is 10 years ago on Facebook, which this is not even as how things move as fast as today. And people started responding that not only did it help ease their pain, is people started responding to me that they chose not to end their own lives because of the information I gave them. So then I felt like I had a bit of a moral responsibility to get these words out. And very courageously, I thought, if I could title a book, We Don't Die, because that was always my dream someday, and then put why I believe in the afterlife in those pages, and then turn that grief audio into chapter 10 of the book. And like it or not, everybody, you know, a lot of people want to believe in the afterlife, but they're not, they might not have lost a loved one. But no matter what, I was going to give them the information because sooner or later, they'd need it. And then the rest of the book was how to have a powerful life if we don't die. And so, boy, I tell you, when you take steps forward in helping another person, even if it's just the tiniest ones, I, I feel like God or the universe steps right in to help. And quickly, all of a sudden, a publisher came around and I could pitch my story. Um, I, I never thought my podcast would be what it is. I was helping a friend of mine started a podcast about business and I thought, geez, I could do this one and talk to people about the afterlife, you know, and I just posted them online and it had a life of its own. Little did I know that there's now something like 20,000 people a day that are listening. So I got to continue sharing and, and, and really learning and my gosh, I love it. I mean, I love all these different people that I've met and all these different reasons to believe but I know that I was there at the beginning as the disbeliever and needed to go on the journey. And so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the journey, if I could, and I'll share a slideshow that I created. And I don't say that any of this is the truth. And like it was mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, the opinions of the guests might not be the opinions of helping parents heal. 
that's fine. There might be something within my words that you can take for your own. You can, it's like if you go to uh, a store and you want to buy a new coat, you can try it on. <laughs> and while you're in the dressing room, you wear it, see how it fits, feels it's comfortable. And if you like it, you buy it and you, you have it. And if you don't, you just simply return it to the rack. So not telling you you have to take this on, but I do know that there is a way of living life is that either everything's an accident or nothing's an accident. And if we live life that we can learn from everything, I think it puts us in the driver's seat of our life as opposed to feeling why did this all happen to me? So on my slideshow, I want to introduce you to some people that have made a pretty darn good life from going from their deepest times. And if you're sitting in deep grief right now, it is really hard to imagine that life could ever be the same and it, it won't be. But down the road, you never know because of your story whose life you can change, save, help, bring a smile to. So Brian, we're going to do a screen share. Okay. All good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everybody for listening to me talk here. Let's play this. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. There is a pine tree called the lodgepole pine. And the only way it can grow is if it burns and burns to a crisp. And inside of it is a really, you know, one of those the tough nuts to crack, so to speak. So it really takes an intense fire to have new growth. And then obviously with new growth, there can be a, a big, strong forest. So how, it used to say trees survive and thrive after a fire, and I changed it to we. So I want to introduce you to my dad. My dad is the reason I'm here today it was and, and i the coat i like to try on is that my dad gave his life in exactly the way he did even my siblings doing their part so that i would go on this journey of discovery and be able to be here with you tonight so this is my dad his name's john champlain okay here are some great people that you will recognize that have made a difference because of their grief I don't need to introduce them to you, but you know just who they are, making a difference, and it all started out of their grief. Don't know if you know this lady, Candace Leitner, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. She started it, oh, I can't remember what year it was, but it was out of her grief that she ended up creating Mothers Against Driving. The fact that we have automatic lights that go on in our car and so many other little nuances of our automobile are all about safety and it all started because of one lady don't you know jk rowling not too many people know that it was the death of her own mom in her grief that she started scribbling some ideas down on a notepad and her imagination kicked in and instead of sinking in the depths of grief, she kicked her imagination in and started writing. And look what we have as a result. We probably all know Suzanne Giesman, a military naval commander, never bought in, never thought too much about the afterlife. Her stepdaughter passed and she and her husband had seen a medium. And the story continues that she herself became a medium and now she's one of the best mediums out there and she is extremely generous and giving. She's got that logical mind and she went looking for answers and found them. And now she's giving back. And that answer is that we don't die, life after death is real and your loved ones are still around. Uh, Dr. Sherry Pearl, you may or may not know her. I have dabbled some in electronic voice phenomena, myself co co collecting some recordings. Um, one says, good night, Sandra, <laughs> on it. Really, really great. Sherry's son works with her. She's got hundreds of examples. And on YouTube, you can actually look up her name. And she teaches people for free 
on her YouTube videos how to work with different sounds and get voices of your loved ones. Now, these things may not be interesting to you. They may be, but these are people that have done some amazing things and it all started from their grief. Phil and Carrie, you may or may not have been on the Helping Parents Heal um, demonstration. They did a mediumship demonstration not too, too long ago. I don't know if it was a month ago or so. Both coming from grief. They both have children in the afterlife and from previous marriages. And they went on journeys and they are two of the best evidential mediums. They come from Scotland. That's where they live and they work with me. They're doing a demonstration, in fact, on this Saturday. But it doesn't matter if you're face to face with a medium, if you are um, on the phone with them, or you can be halfway around the world. Our loved ones can bring their energy to them for them to talk to the medium and then they're able to say your loved one is with you. Now here's the thing, you don't need to go to a medium to be with your loved one. Your loved ones are all around you. We can't see this invisible internet that connects us right now. It's a different form of energy. And when we pass into the unseen world, we vibrate at a different energy. We are still us. Same personality, same zest for life, same love, same sense of humor, and they're around you every moment. Sonia Rinaldi, may or may not have heard of her. She is, to me, one of the absolute best reasons to believe in the afterlife. Uh, her husband had passed, and she went into this researching of electronic voice phenomena, and she would record sounds of chopped up human voices, and then record that and then when she played the recording there were voices on them what was interesting is she was in she lives in brazil actually and she worked with bereaved parents and this was over 20 years ago she would have a parent with her in her laboratory and an empty chair and she would say speak to your child they are in that chair you just can't see them and she would record the parent talking and then this chopped up voices sound, and then the parent talking again. And then when she replayed it, instead of the chopped up voices, it would be the parent talking back to the child. I mean, the child talking back to the parent. And she worked with over 3,000 parents this way, only giving it away, and a 100% success rate at making these connections. She has moved on, to many things and they call it instrumental trans communication and it's using different devices to try to record pictures and sounds and things like that of the people in the afterlife sonia believes she's working with nikola tesla the great inventor along with other scientists and how she knows this is not only had they given their names to her with these recordings but if you can see the picture of Nikola Tesla there, one of Sonia's past experiments is she would uh, put like a television on a static channel. That's the best way I can say it. Or on a computer, she would have just static playing. And then she would record it. And when she'd play it back frame by frame, these pictures would come up. So not only did Nikola Tesla say his name, his picture came up. Nikol Nikola Tesla, never smiled in any pictures ever taken and he smiles in the pictures that Sonia gets. This is just one of many and like I said there's um, many different people that have come through also with not only their picture that way but with their voice. So we had a uh, one of my first events was called We Don't Die Boston. We did that in February of last year and someone had asked Sonia the question what is the next stage of your investigation? What is it you want to experiment with? And it's Scott Milligan, and he is a medium also. And one of the things she had this dream of doing was to get these th three or four little miniature projectors that could project light into a center location. And in this case, you can see it, and it looks, it, what it is, it's actually a big chocolate Easter egg mold. And her vision was to put all these all this light into the center and then film it. Didn't know what would happen, but Scott actually ran out to Best Buy and presented to her these four little projectors. 
And so when we got together again in April, we did a We Don't Die Orlando, she had some results to show us. Those, my friends, are pictures of the static electricity or static energy that went into this egg and Sonia would film it and then she would go frame by frame. Now, in this case, she was working with parents. Sonia has thousands of pictures and she's got a Patreon page. I don't know if you know what Patreon is, um, but it's, it's one of these, it's like a donation site. If you donate $5, you can access all of her things. Um, just because she, she's not making any money doing this. She's never asked for a dime. And several of us thought it, it serves her to, so she can get more equipment and things like that um, if people would like to donate. But she has what's called e-magazines and she's got, I think, almost 30 of them. And she would have a conversation with a parent and then do one of these recordings in, in Brazil and these people would come through. And on the bottom, you can see it looks a little fuzzy, but that's a dog. <laughs> You'll be very happy to know that our animals live on, but these are actual children of people that are in our We Don't Die community. And you may even recognize them yourself. Now, what's interesting is Sonia started sending me these pictures of an unknown. And I recognize this as my father. I see my dad, how he was in the Air Force. And my, I'm going to whisper this because mom's in the next room. She doesn't always believe all my stories. But when I started showing her these pictures, she says that these aren't pictures of him as he was alive. And here's a picture of my dad. And here is just side by side from something that Sonia had, had taken. And I've actually seen the raw footage of the static electricity and then she can play it very, very slow motion. And in just a second, the face appears, almost 3D, and then it disappears again. It's absolutely amazing. And I know you know, if you were to see a picture of your loved one, that your heart knows that's absolutely who they are. So to take me from this, I, I believe in the afterlife, to all of a sudden, holy cow, there's my father. It's a whole nother level. We are in the process of, uh, we raised almost $50,000 to create a documentary on Sonia. Many of you were kind enough to, to donate. And the next stage is two days ago, I was supposed to be on a flight to Brazil to film in Sonia's laboratory and that's postponed. But other than that, most of the, the documentary is ready. So that mind that I was telling you about that has this hard time believing sometimes in this afterlife business and could it all be true? I just wanted to give you the 30,000, well, it's even higher than that view. We are twirling around on this planet. That's our own special planet called planet earth. And then somewhere out there, that's the, the stars and things. Someone, someone had once done some research and they, speculate that for every grain of sand on our planet earth there's a thousand suns like our sun probably with planets on them or around them okay it's a pretty big universe we go back a little bit further there's our milky way and somewhere in there is you and me right now on the zoom call and and there we go even further there's <laughs> who knows it's, part, it's just a little snippet of our universe so I'm just asking you to believe that we don't have to understand how something works to have it be real. We don't have to understand how our cell phone works and it's real. It's picking up energy and it's not connecting to anything. We can connect with our loved ones. We are energy. We don't die. This is something that I just put together, just some basics. And basically, you cannot see the future and the purpose of your suffering from where you now stand, but in years to come, you will. And I'm not saying that things happen for a reason. I don't buy into that. Some terrible accidents happen. And by 
a being a by, as a byproduct of being human, some awful stuff can happen. What I am asking you to consider is that wherever you are right now can be the start or continuation of a, a, a growth, a spiritual growth, if you will, and that you'll learn things and you'll be able to look back and realize if that hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened. Practice gratitude, love, and appreciation. It can be really awful and sad and dangerous and you feel all these feelings of guilt and the mind never stops. But if you can take a moment and kind of make that mind, that voice take a little detour and start thinking about who you love, be in the present moment. If you have a dog or cat, pet them and just be really in the present moment. Think about things that you appreciate. Think about things you're grateful for. That can turn and short circuit those thoughts and make you feel better. And once you start feeling better, that's when these, these neurotransmitters that I was mentioning can start building again. Quiet your mind as often as possible and live in the present moment. The present moment is the access way for all kinds of things. I mean, a lot of people that have written songs and painted beautiful works of art, um, even mediums, they say, you know, they get in the zone. And that zone is in the present moment. And I think when our busy mind chatter is there, uh, the, this unseen world, the spirit world, heaven, whatever you want to call it, when our mind is busy, we can't hear them. But when we're quiet, they can be very loud. When all else fails, turn to helping another. Some people say service is the coin of the spirit world. If you can get your attention off yourself, which can be very, very difficult in tough times, and just do a little thing for another person, oh my gosh, it, it, it just comes back to you tenfold, just a, a better feeling. So these are just a little, some tools that can help. This picture I love, it's called Goodbye and Welcome by Charles Santoso. And I say, you are a divine soul living a human experience. Your life matters. You will see your loved ones again. And be gentle on yourself. As the mom and the two boys are crying over the passing of dear Grammy, you know, there she is being welcomed by her beloved and her friends and even the dog and the cat are there. I love that. Um, this is just a little bit about my grief to glory. That's my book. That's the CD, How to Survive Grief. You can see wedontdieradio.com. If you go to wedontdieradio.com, there's a little pop-up and it says join Sanders Insiders Siders Club. That's just my mailing list. But you will get a complimentary copy of How to Survive Grief. It says read a few chapters from my book. Well, once you start reading, you'll realize it's the whole book. You know, I'm not going to let anything stop you from getting this information. And I, I give away more books than I sell, and I don't care. I've done some live events. Unfortunately, the ones we've had planned for 2020 have been postponed to 2021, but they're going to happen. Uh, we are now doing these Sunday gatherings that every Sunday, it's been eight weeks now that we're getting together. Um, let me just stop sharing my screen here that we're getting together online on Zoom, just like this, and doing a, a celebration of life. And at the end, life and the afterlife, we have some mediums at the end that even do a few medium readings on the online group that we have. So what's it all about? I think that we are souls having this human experience. I think that energy can exist in the same exact time and space. So just as our wireless internet is around us, our loved ones are around us. It takes us getting into the present moment with a prayer in our heart, with building a new kind of relationship. You have that love for one another, but let them know I'm here. Go ahead, walk a little closer, kiss me on the cheek. You know, you may get the goosebumps and trust that's your soul picking up on the energy of theirs. They are still around. When someone passes, 
even in times of pain or those kind of things, it's been told to me many, many times, and even by people who've had these near-death experiences, that often the soul can leave the body before the body shuts down. So in times like my dad in pain or, or your loved one, there's no sense of pain. There's no memory of it. Sometimes when they come through a medium, they, they tell how their body died, just to let you know that that is your person, but there's no feeling of that. You are greeted by your loved ones. It is like you are crossing the finish line and they're all there doing the wave. Your loved ones are there, your pets are there. There is not necessarily a time needed for healing. There are people that have passed and have come through a medium talking to their loved one on the very same day. There could be an adjustment period. There are some people that never buy, bought into this afterlife and you know what? They find out that it's real. <laughs> so it might take them a little while to get used to it. But they are there. There's places called the halls of learning where they can learn to communicate. There are people that are helpers that will help them communicate. Not everybody comes through a medium. Sorry to say, sometimes people, uh, it might take a little while. They say there's no time or space in the afterlife. So our whole lifetime could occur to them like just a blink of an eye. You know, they're not sitting there being sad. They're happy. They're joyful. They want you to be happy. They want you to be joyful. Your hands will meet. Your, you will hug again. Um, it's a beautiful place. I think that the afterlife is someplace that it's good and wonderful all the time. And we choose to come to this earth for our soul to grow and that we need to have the opposite. So I know I have felt much higher joy because I've felt some deep pain and I'm a whole different person now at the age of 54 than I was as a kid. And it's sometimes the toughest things that give us the most amount of soul growth. So the one thing I want you to just really take from this is it is hard to be a human being. The hardest time you will ever experience is here. And that sucks sometimes. There's a lot of love too, but it can be very, very difficult. If there's something that I've said that makes you want to research more, you can feel free to write to me. Sandra Champlain at gmail.com is me. I'll give you more information. It, it feels good to have your mind on a project or something uh, and even being involved in helping parents heal is such a good thing to be part of a community that speaks the same language. Don't not be involved. Um, it's, it's very easy for us humans to want to be alone, but have a friend, talk to somebody. Don't get caught up in that little voice in your head that's always there. And I'm looking forward to that voice being gone someday because it can be brutal. But with that, I'd love to open it up for any questions. I want to thank everybody for their time this evening or today, giving it so generously to me. I hope it has made a difference. If I could give you, give, have a magic wand and have you go through everything that I've gone through in almost 25 years, you would know beyond a shadow of a doubt your loved one is still with you. And it is hard because we miss them. We miss them dearly but we will see them again. So thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Um, you touched on the, the Sunday services. Could you tell people more about how they can find out how to uh, log on to those? Yeah, uh, sure can. We don't die radio.com. And there's a little tab that you can press on that says Sunday gathering. I think it's a Sunday online church service or something like that. And uh, yeah, every Sunday. And there's a place to register. So you'll get a Zoom link to register. And they last about an hour and a half. And then they're all recorded. So that registration link, if you can't be with us live, you can also go to that registration link and see the replay. So Brian was our guest on the last one. So you can see that replay. And then Elizabeth Wasson was our guest on the one prior to that, Mother's Day. But it's a good place to be connected. Yeah, it's really, really uplifting everyone. I'd say uh, 
you know, if you if you can't get out, which a lot of us can't right now, it's a great great place to be. And if you can't get out, it's a great place to be. That's right. Uh, Lindsay would like to know your feelings on suicide and whether it's planned, Sandra. Um, my personal feeling is it's now when you say planned, I think I don't think it's part of a soul's plan. If that's what you're asking, I think. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, the question says, your feelings on suicide, please. And then she just says a plan, question mark. So I'm assuming she's asking yeah. if it's planned. Well, some people think there's a time that we're all destined to check out of this life. And now that might be possible. Uh, it could be. That's just never been anything that I've explored. But what I can tell you is being human is really hard. And the pain that people feel to take that action. And they there's no punishments, there's no nothing. People are accepted with open arms when they cross over. Um, what they can see is the loved ones that are left behind and feel the sadness because you can see their loved ones feeling it, but they are embraced and they're held and you will see them again. They're, oh, I forgot to tell you some good news about the afterlife is you get to pick your favorite age you get to pick your perfect health and you're just restored healthy and whole and complete. Awesome. Um, any other questions for Sandra? I, think I, I don't bite. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dana asked, were you able to reunite with your siblings? I think you kind of touched upon that, but I think she might've missed that. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, one brother, not at all. He's out doing his own thing. One sister about three years ago has come back in, which has been really nice. And then my other sister has been just this past January. And we actually met for the very first time at a Panera. So we are working on it. Yeah. Um, how are you able to manage a real job and do all the spiritual work on the side? Oh, it's tough. <laughs> it's really tough. In between the day job, I would come home and record as many episodes of We Don't Die Radio as I could. And then um, when I would have a week off, I would plan one of my events. Now, here's the weird thing. Uh, it's gonna be quite some time before I think there's gonna be automobile racing with fans on it and us having a big tent that holds 800 people. So my mom and I are actually looking like, what if we don't end up going back right away? So what I'm doing is I'm creating a lot of online courses and just, um, and I, you know, who knows, maybe this is part of the bigger picture because that job, although it pays the mortgage, it doesn't feed my soul, but I know it does make a difference. So it's in God's hands, but it's tough yeah. to juggle both. I understand. Um, Shannon wants to know if you get given any readings since your experience. I haven't given any readings. What I have done is dabbled now and again taking a mediumship course. And so when I am with a group of people and we're all doing it, it's like I'll have the courage to try it again. But there's something that if fear is there at the same time, it completely shuts off that flow. And I have not yet overcome the fear. So I know for me as a human being, that's something that's on my bucket list for my own growth because I don't want to live a life in fear. So very slowly, I, I step into that now and again. So probably because we have some downtime now, I will do that again. Yeah, so. I know you've done quite a bit of training, so it's probably time, Sandra. Well, there's training and then there's <laughs> practice. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. um, Jody asked, do you think animals can see spirit? Yes, absolutely I do. I think they see colors we don't see. I think they hear things we don't hear. And there's been many stories of, of animals, how they can just like watch almost like somebody walking across the room. And then even mediums would say, your dog has seen this and things like that. So I absolutely do. Yeah. And they're unconditional love. They're in the present moment, only filled with love. So, or hunger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Susan asks, do you, have, do you have success connecting through meditation? Uh, yes, there is meditation that you can go on like a guided imagery, that kind of meditation. In fact, I recorded one called Reconnections that, 
I'm going to see how I can send it to you, Brian, and you can post it. Um, so you can just share that with everybody free. And it's like a guided meditation where you can go to your favorite place and be re reunited with your loved one. And although, again, you might feel this is just your imagination, suddenly the pictures are very, very clear or the feeling of love is much stronger and we really have to go with it. It's a, a real thing. Um, but there's also a different kind. It's not really meditation. It's when you can have a prayer in your heart of either connection or you want to build up your own soul power. People call it sitting in the power. And then I imagine a white light in the center of me, which is like my soul. And then I imagine it getting really big. And then I imagine the sun being God. This is my thing. You can take it if you want. And then I just imagine those lights merging. And then I just sit there. And it's kind of like when you plug in your cell phone, you know, you need to charge it before it works or you need to keep it charged so it works. I think our beings, our souls need this quiet time, this meditation, this connection so that those God-given soul powers that we have get stronger. Thank you. Yeah, great answer. Mm -hmm. um, Anna asks, does it matter how our children die in the sense of do they regret it? No. What I think, I think, I, I don't think the word is regret. I think uh, I've spoken to maybe 40 people that have had these near death experiences and there's no judgment for anybody other than yourself about how you lived life. And we actually will review our life from other people's perspective. So if we cause somebody pain, we would feel that. And if we cause somebody joy, we would feel that. And it's not like a make wrong, but it's like how your soul grew while you were here. So I think there is this sense um, that maybe something could have been done differently or maybe a regret that I caused that pain but then you can also see the flip side. So it's not any, you're not lingering in this doom and gloom and regret and pain. You're seeing how your soul moved on. And again, your children are just surrounded with loved ones that are right there with them as they experience this. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Carol says, why do you think it's necessary for our souls to experience the pain and negativity of this world? I think first of all, two things. One is I think there's a byproduct of just being human that we feel this stuff. I don't think we're meant to feel pain and agony as part of our soul's growth. I, I think there's diseases. I think there's some awful things that happen that I don't believe they're meant to happen. I think it's just a byproduct of being human. However, what I do believe is it's in some of the darkest times and some of the worst situations that we have the potential to grow, become more understanding, become more compassionate, to learn things, to be able to help other people. Now, this is one of those things I'm asking you to try on because I don't know for sure, but it, it's a more empowering way to live life to be able to say, if my dad didn't go that way and my siblings didn't behave the way they did, I wouldn't be here now, as opposed to making them wrong for the last 10 years. So hopefully that helps. Mm -hmm. um, Ty says, you've done so much already, but where would you like your journey to take you next? Mm, hi, Ty, that's a great question. I think I still want to share. I still want to explore. I want to do some big events in cooperation with Helping Parents Heal and some of the other organizations to bring like-minded people together. And so that we have communities that don't just meet on the internet, that we can meet and go to coffee together, that we create people in our daily life that we can have these chats with. I really want to create support. For myself, I do want to overcome the fear and go into my own self development as far as sitting on behalf of God and the spirit friends and saying, how, how can I best serve? Um, 
and just see what happens there. Cause I've witnessed a whole heck of a lot of neat stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think there's more for all of our souls to experience. So I just want to see what's possible. I, I haven't even touched on this, but I had taken a class really learning to quiet the mind and then having either my computer there or a piece of paper and doing one of these sessions of like my light shining out and the light from God coming in and just saying, I'm here, whatever you want to say. And out of my own hand writing has come some poetry, words of inspiration. And in my mind, I hear a word, I write it down. It's not like I'm creating it. And then I look at the page and it's this unbelievably poetic thing that I'm clear it didn't come from me. So whatever that is that's happening, I want to, I want to do more of that and and see who's who are who is on my spirit team we all have them we have loved ones we have these guides and i think for me i just want to delve into working with whatever that power is because it's all inspirational and it all helps me be inspired and then of course i share everything awesome uh janice says i'm hearing impaired but i've been hearing music and seeing visions since the age of three but shut down when i was criticized as a child i now hear music 24 7 and I wonder what to do with this. I have had multiple visions and amazing experiences with my son at all times of the day. And I wonder if I'm close to transitioning because of what I, what I can see. I don't think it's close to transitioning. I think you have, and maybe not chosen to this, but your soul has just alive and awake and is being able to tap into that unseen world. And Hopefully it's not a distraction from you because I know there's people that are mediums that can always see people and they've actually said, okay, friends, between the hours of this time and this time I'm working and then this other time I'm off and with my family. So there's a way that we can ask them to turn that off for when we need it to. But I don't think you're close to transitioning. I just think your soul is alive. And I think that's something that we can all attain and might, might not be through music but it could be through some good ideas coming in, uh, you know, really getting in the zone to whatever it is that lights you up inside. So I actually just think your, your soul is more in tune than some of the others, rest of us. Awesome. Um, Nancy says, I wonder if most small children can see people in spirit form. Yes. I've heard so many stories from children or about children and there's no blocking them. I think between the age of zero and seven, you know, our imagination is really strong. And then we start developing our own strong identity whenever that comes in. And, you know, it's also the age when the first thing happens and a teacher might say something or you might feel stupid or whatever that is that we start building that voice that's inside of our head. But before that voice, when we're little, I think they are tuned right into it but unfortunately it gets shut down a lot of people say oh it's your imaginary friend that's not real and it shuts it right down yeah i uh, carol asks what is your what is your take on the thinning of the veil do you believe the veil is thinning do i believe the veil is thinning i say how am i going to say this um while the veil could be thinning i think us human beings are coming to a point where we are quieting our mind, even times like being homebound, like I still am with my mom, the fact that when we're quieting our mind, we are being able to sense more of this, the hereafter, our loved ones, the unseen world, spirit world, whatever you want to call it. It may seem like the veil is thinning. However, I think it's because our mind is being more in the present moment. How many of us haven't had the constant worry and always being the hamster spinning on the wheel, thinking about the future? We've actually had to time where you haven't had to set the alarm clock, that you've had time to think and see what's important and, and you're tapping into that present moment. So I don't necessarily, I mean, it may be the veil being thinner, but I also think we're being quieter and we're allowing that in. In fact, again, mom's in the next room. 
she often doesn't buy into this, but what's happening to her lately is her and I are thinking the same thoughts at the same time. She's having dreams of her parents and her loved one and the dog she had when she was a kid. And so she and I are getting into more of these conversations. And I think just because she's not worried about work, then, you know, for her, she's being in the present and these people are being able to come through. So it's awesome. <laughs> wow. Um, this is a multiple part question. So let me break this down. Uh, Anna says, what does spirit look like? Are they just like we're here on earth or do we, or do we look differently? I think we can look how we want to look. I think um, when, well, as far as I know from the medium readings that I have given that I was right. And even from my friends that are mediums, it's as if in your imagination, you can see the person from head to toe. Whereas if you just imagine somebody, you're kind of like, okay, what color eyes did they have? You know, what would they be wearing? Whereas this, it's like, they got a ball cap on, they got blonde hair, they got blue eyes, they're wearing this kind of shirt. So we're still us. And I, I think we can communicate with our mind, with our thoughts. I think with our mind, we can change what we're wearing. I don't think we necessarily have to be eating and drinking. I think, you know, we don't have a body as such, but there's, um, they call it, I think it's called like the land of familiarity, familiarity, huh? that's a word, when we first transition. So everything is things that we're used to seeing. So it's not like we're gobs of energy. We're, we're still us. Was there another part or did I get it? Oh yeah, there's a couple more. Okay. <laughs> Do they sleep? Do uh, sleep? No, I don't think so. I think you can if you want to, but I don't think there's a need to because there's no body it's you don't feel hungry not that you can't enjoy something because people say you can um but i don't think it's like lights go out at night and you go to bed but i think we could create that for ourselves because people say you can create the home of your dreams you could create um so many things with your mind so you know if you want to cuddle up with your spouse and sleep i'm sure you could create that but i don't think it's a, a need yeah and third part of the question is, do they have a similar life as on earth? A similar life? Yeah, similar life as on yes. earth. Yes, I think that there are jobs to be done. I think they're joyful. I think they're gifts of service. I think people, I, I can't even tell you how many people have correctly described my grandmother and told me she's a greeter. You know, she's one of the first people <laughs> that they see when they cross over and she's this little thing filled with love so I can get that. But I think you can have your own hobbies. I think you can have a home. I think you can work. Um, but it's all done in service and in joy, as opposed to working hard to put food on the table kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's joyful. Uh, Lindsay says, I feel that God loves us all unconditionally. What are your feelings? Uh, amen, sister. <laughs> I do. Um, Carrie says, do you think it's true that we can just call on our, on our loved one and they're here with us? Can they hear us at all times? I think they can hear us at all times. I think they don't necessarily have to be listening at all times. I think they're doing things, but they're just a moment away. You know, um, their love for us is, is so strong and that connection never dies, never. And so while I don't think somebody wrote a book do dead people watch me in the shower and i think that kind of sums it up no they don't they're busy but they really they can just snap your fingers and they're right there because when you think about it if i'm a medium and i'm working with you and you're halfway around the world and then all of a sudden they're with the loved one it's only a, a like millisecond of a thought and that they can be with us so yeah. you, you keep talking to them they're, they're there and especially while we're grieving and having a tough time, I mean, they want to do everything they can to let them know, let you know that they're with you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about this question. I'll read it to you, see if you can figure it out. Okay. If we were on the other side with our loved ones, how can we see that at all? I think I've seen as being with our, as being with your eyes, and I really want to see my son. I think we have capabilities far beyond what we have here. I think the people that have had near-death experiences say that they can see 360 degrees around. They can feel 
colors and sounds. Like, how would you feel a color or a sound? There's colors that don't exist here that they see there. I think our senses are so much stronger and that we have more senses than we don't, that, than we have here. So you will be able to experience your sun in a way that you even haven't here. It, it'll be more vivid, more clear, uh, lots of love. Um, but you, you don't lose any senses. I mean, I think everything's enhanced. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions for Sandra? Good questions, everybody. Yeah, we always get great questions. Really good questions. And this is from my experiences from 340 hours of interviewing people and an additional 20 years of me on this journey, going to seminars, reading books, witnessing some crazy stuff. And also yeah. meeting some lunatics also. I think there's a good, you know, my mom would always say, what do you call the guy who's bottom of his graduating class from medical school? And the answer is doctor. So just because somebody has a shingle out that says medium does not mean necessarily that they know what they're doing or they're the best of the best. Uh, we really have to go by people's recommendations and go with what feels right. Somebody's charging a ton of money and it doesn't feel like it has integrity. Don't go with it. There's plenty of people that are real good that um, are very, very fair priced. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think that might be all the questions. Uh, Sandra, thanks very much for being with us again. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, you can reach Sandra at wedontdie.com. Um, and you can find uh, her book there. You can find out about the Sunday at gatherings, uh, which is your, our, our recommend everybody. 340 uh, hours of episodes. So if you ever yeah, get lonesome. Yeah, 340 hours of episodes, <laughs> um, which are fantastic. You get some yeah. great guests on and, and really good uh, information there. So all the questions you guys have, they're all answered somewhere in those 340 hours of episodes. Yeah, that's it. It's all you need to do. <laughs> no, or send me an email, sandrachamplain at gmail.com because I can always be hook you up with the right episode or a link or if there's something that you're really passionate in or you want to find out more about. I am a big fan of helping parents heal and I would do anything and everything to make your journey better. And I'll give you anything I've got. So I hope Thanks, you pick me up on that. We appreciate that very My much. My pleasure. I'm going to uh, open everybody's mic so they can say good night. Uh, I want to say Sandra's great seeing you again. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. 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 Th